Hello, Dorothy. Hi, Dorothy. So, who's going to go? Is yours on a uh, pen drive, or how would you like? I was going to log in. Okay, and, and you've got it stored. Access, yeah, it's in my email. Okay, groovy. Why don't you get going doing that? Okay. So, at this point, um, Catherine's going to log in and get her stuff going, and then we'll have yours afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're still... Well, we're going to see if we can at least get the EGG okay. stuff pulled off and, and some little snippets. Mm -hmm. You guys are smiling. Of course, I know it's a grimace more than a smile. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, it's just a matter of compiling it to the sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well... I'm, I'm sorry it is the way it is, and you guys just present what you got on Friday. Dorothy sent me her PowerPoint, and I looked at it, and she and I are getting together tomorrow, and we'll make a few little edits here and there, but it looks really good. I think the logs for, that Abigail sent me, the three that I picked, I'm just going to pull up like Catherine's stream and just show them. Yep. Is that okay? Yep. And then... But I'll have them like printed out for you. To okay. It. Okay. And... Um, yeah, what else are you planning so, you know, we can kind of work smoothly with presentation stuff? Mine is just, I'm going to do a, a brief overview of my summary of what I found. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's going to have the list of articles, and mm -hmm. then I'm just going to show those slides, and then I also intend to have some video feed later on. Okay, and that's, okay. So I just need to show those three things. Perfect. Okay, that'll be great. And... Hopefully we'll be able to plug a few little things into that. Yeah. And I I have the video from Jill's camera, but you can't see the screen. Yeah. So I don't know if it's even worth Yeah. And I have I mean I put one of the pictures um, of us on there. And then I have my compiled resources. Perfect. Yep. I think the more that we can just, you know, kind of use the screen to kind of highlight, you know, or, you know, with the PowerPoint and so on. Perfect. Kind of keep it low tech. And, um, yeah, and then just having a print copy. Or if you want to turn in the PowerPoint, you know, send me a copy of it. Just email me a copy of it. Make sense? How's it going? It's going well. I'm just setting the, we're not going to watch the whole Yeah. It's always a good sound. Dun, dun, dun. Sorry, Dorothy, this isn't a very exciting video yet. <laughs> it will be very exciting in just a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm still looking for pushing buttons and says something comes up. Okay. Oh. Well, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> that must be 
the hour of the secret. When pushing the, the power button from on to off, not a good. There we go. Okay. So. So I'm going to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Watch, I have four videos. change in having that resistance um, no longer there m made things difficult for a while until they got used to it. Um, and then I, me personally, I, I talk about myself personally, um, I, and I'm, you know, because I've done like a lifestyle change, mm -hmm. it hasn't been, I've noticed differences in support, it feels different not bad mm -hmm. and not where it's been a drastic change where I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. It's just slightly different. Um, Deborah says in her interview with Good Morning America, um, everyone has to do 
what is best for themselves and what is healthiest for themselves, which is very true. And also, she claims that her voice does not change and still pours out like liquid gold. <laughs> she said humbly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fantastic voice if you've ever heard her sing. Um, so, and then we'll also add a male. So we're also going to hear from um, Mark Panuccio, who is an operatic tenor who lost 150 pounds. And his is through a lifestyle change. So we have the two, you know, she's the surgery, he did, he changed everything. Um, and he says there has been a change. However, the only change, the change is a good change. Uh, it now appears that he has more clarity in his voice. And it's easier, everything's easier. And a uh, bonus, he now is, that, that caused him to land leading roles instead of secondary supporting mm -hmm. roles. Um, do you want to have some comment now, or? Okay. Yeah. Any comments on what she shared at this point? I remember being told once, I can't remember when, but that it is easier to sing if you're heavier because you have that resistance, like, pulling against. Were I you told this by a, a heavier person or by a thinner <laughs> person? I don't remember. Yeah. See, my, my thinking is, okay, yes, you do have that resistance. You know, you have more stuff there. But all of that has a metabolic cost. You know, you run out of breath faster because you're not in as good a shape. Cardiovascularly, you know, that having all that extra weight really taxes your body. And so what you might lose on the sensation side, you actually probably gain on the improved overall body function. So I would imagine, you know, if you're a sensation guided person, you just would kind of reorient and that's what you've been talking about. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, I've taught people, I had a student who had a gastric bypass done and she actually eventually kind of gained the weight back, um, but she lost about 100 pounds. And um, for a while there, as she kept the weight off, you know, she moved better, she felt better. Um, I don't know whether she actually had them just, you know, it was the lap band thing, whether she just said, forget it, you know, or what. But um, yeah, she, she lost over 100 pounds. Um, and you know, you mentioned the, the Rene Gupta thing. Excess weight results in increased production and storage of female hormones, okay? And that's why uh, they're like uh, people who have some of the breast cancer genes, your incidence of, your, your risk of having breast cancer is elevated when you're overweight because estrogen levels. Now the whole bit about higher testosterone, okay, that's if you have the extra weight. So if you lose that extra weight, your voice then might, you might not have that high of a testosterone level, you know. I would need to read more of the literature to, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm sure there's stuff done on non-singers. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if, I don't right. know if there are a lot of studies because the number of people who are professional oriented singers, you know, that's already narrows it down to a small pool and then who are overweight and are losing weight, and you get them in a study and track it, and tracking their 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 body hormonal levels, that's a. It would be a great study to do, but you'd have to be in like a major, like New York or something like that, to have a large enough pool of of singers to do it. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, let's see what uh, Deborah Boyd has to say, because I mean, here's somebody who's singing you know, at the leading opera houses around the world.
Control on the screen is the best.
where weight was Hutch in Boy Scout knows, but Mark has now developed muscle. His last performance at the Cincinnati Opera, O Solo Mio, earned rave reviews and a standing ovation. This is my passion, this is my soul, this is my heart, and this is why I'm here. change your voice. However, if we are making ourselves healthier and, um, you know, losing weight, then I, I feel like that's just only going to reveal our true voice because we will be the healthiest and best version of ourselves, mm -hmm. which means we can only, you know, have the healthiest and best version of our voice. Yep. I completely agree. And I think the need for a, a blinded study where you had recordings of people before and after, and people who have no idea what they're hearing, you know, what change went on, just rating which recording A or B do we like better, you know, um, of the same repertoire. And again, a very controlled thing, looking at, um, you know, changes in hormones and, you know, uh, really clearly testing uh, things like, you know, maximum phonation time and doing the voice range profile where you really can track, okay, well, are, is there objectively a change in this person's ability to sing long phrases, their range, their intensity level, and then having expert judges who are blind to when recordings were made or even what changes happened listening and rating recordings. So there's your doctoral dissertation right there. Kaboom. All right, we need to get you logged in. Okay. So uh, did you log out? I did. Okay. So it's on you to win. Okay, so you want to just run your laptop through the thing? Okay, I see you. so we can pull it up here because it looks like you don't own it. Is the pen drive here? Is this yours? Okay. Um, yeah. Let's just do that. Because if you don't have a serial, the 16 pen serial um, thing on your laptop, which a lot of them don't nowadays. <laughs> Okay, so while she's hunting and pecking over there, which is fine. So Friday we'll have you two guys and Dorothy. And um, any questions about the exam while she's getting that going? Do you want us to answer it like an essay? Or, oh, you want me to answer that question? Sorry, I don't remember the answer. Like on the corrective techniques? Yeah, you can, you know, yeah. I would have them do this and one or two sentences is plenty, not a whole page. I don't want us to install apps. I know, well, it's going to do its thing. It, it <laughs> might take a minute or so. Um, and at this point, there's no stopping it. <laughs> um, other questions? Yes. I'm going to sign up for um, Oh, Dream. thank you. You're welcome. Yes, we, we spoke about that. So. Let's get a little sign up for us. I think anything that's left up here on this is fair game.
theme? Well, Monty Python, right? Yeah. But so are we bringing it to lunch time? So it's yeah. Will people eat lunch or yeah? Bring let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. So. and salsa, or healthy veggies, or... Yeah, a veggie tray with... That would be good. Someone want to bring a preservable? A health food? Yeah. What do you want to think? <laughs> um, No salami. No salami. <laughs> salami bad. Salami. <laughs> salami and bologna bad. You're hiding behind the camera. Oh. Never mind. Okay, I'll get the screen.
in addition to that, flexibility, registration, test lab skill, and character traits um, are important. Um, he doesn't write a lot about these character traits, I've noticed. Um, most of the book is just devoted to repertoire and talking about singers. Um, but luckily, Pearl Eden McGinnis, later on in the presentation, she talks about um, the specifics. Uh, it's important to remember that clocks are subjective to many, many things, because um, every ear is different, and every teacher that you encounter or every coach you encounter is going to have a different opinion on what the clock should be. Um, and generally, tradition will inform interpretation. Um, so, for example, uh, even though Mozart wrote all of his roles in um, Così Fan Tutte as sopranos with no definitions, tradition has made it so that Fioravella um, is performed by a mezzo soprano, that Fior de Luigi is performed by a prima coratura, and that um, Justina is a soubrette, behind even a lyric mezzo. Um, also, composers will write, you know, big roles that encompass multiple clocks. An example of, of which could be um, La Traviata, uh, Violetta. She's any anywhere from a dramatic coloratura to a lyric to a spinto. It's just all just lumped together in each section of the opera is different because you've got to be able to sing in those nuanced ways. Um, size and composition of the theater matters. Uh, for example, uh, people who generally could not sing Wagner in America or in other places could maybe sing Wagner in um, his theater in Bayreuth. Because of the way it's designed, there's a shell over the orchestra, um, making it so that the voice like glides over the top and um, the orchestra doesn't impede the sound. It's, it's pretty cool. So lighter voices can actually sing Wagner in Bayreuth. Um, it's also important to remember that clocks can change over time, um, even with, with weight loss. We, we, we talked about weight loss, but also your age, your experience. Um, well, if you have children, Sometimes children can change your clock. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> well, the, 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 the act of being pregnant, what all the hormones, all of the everything that happens, the actual giving birth, all of those things can affect the voice. Um, and then people can also bounce around in clocks until they find the right type. And you can cut and paste, and you can commission clocks. This is particularly um, a soprano thing. Uh, just because he, he recommends that we can go two, two categories in either direction. We can go two up the lightness scale or two down the darkness scale. Um, Pearl Eden McGinnis, she mentions, and maybe we should just give one, one above, one below, because we don't want to cover too much. We want to be as specific as possible when we're auditioning and performing for singing classes. So here are some basic definitions that Bolger uses to define his soprano role. And we have soubrette, which is our skirmish girl, whose light voice can usually command. The coloratura, who can sing quick runs, leaps, and fiore fiore. The lyric soprano, which is medium and warm in color, specializing in the battle lines and romantic characters. The spinto, which has more brilliance than a lyric, um, and not quite as much darkness as a dramatic. The Julische is a title tacked on to um, a lot of um, mostly the dramatic box, saying that eventually you will be dramatic, but right now you're still a wee baby and you're learning and growing. Um, dramatic are the ones that we associate with, with Wagner, Verdi, and Strauss. Um, and then Hoff is just like literally the tippy toppiest of those composers. The biggest, most grandiose, most vocally challenging um, dramatic roles. So yeah, you could have somebody Hoch dramatische Mm -hmm. you know, and that's like Lucia and things like that. Mm. Okay, and so here, um, this chart I copied from the book, my hand, but um, <laughs> these are the, the main soprano fox. Um, he gives ranges, he gives registers. Uh, registers I found to be um, really not that helpful uh, because if a, if a singer trains and is proficient, most of the time you're not gonna have a weak low, like a soubrette, for example, or a just a good top, or just a great top. You'll be 
most singers, I believe, what you want is to be just like a lyric song of praise. Um, well, and, and these are, I mean, I would disagree about a weak low. You can't mm -hmm. sing Susanna exactly. or Despina you can, you can't. with a weak low voice. It's not possible. So, anyway. Uh, timbre is also yeah. another one of those things that you can, you can give and take. Um, a lot of people prefer different timbres for different songs, so it's one of the most subjective parts of establishing a song. Um, there, um, I guess where it gets most like drastic in the timbre change-wise is when we start playing into the dramatic territory. Um, once we get into there, you can really tell that there is a color change. There's a lot more richness, a lot more darkness, a lot more heft, um, and it's just those voices that you that you hear and are just so, so big, so, so big without pushing, they're just odd. Um, the rest of the, the, about the top half, I'd say, of, of the uh, chart is more um, specializations within a lighter soprano song. So you can be a lighter soprano and you could really specialize in any of these, depending on what the strengths are. Um, the challenges, I thought were really good because that can help you determine which one is gonna be your best strength. Um, for example, two breaths, you've got to be a good actress. That's one of the main things about being a two breath. You've got to be a good actress, and you've got to be good at languages, um, especially German, because oftentimes two breaths have roles in uh, Singspiel, and Singspiel um, has spoken dialect in German, and you've got to be able to speak it and sound like a native. Um, tight lyric literatures, they've got to be agile. Lyrics have got to have exquisite phrasing capabilities. Spintos have got to be penetrating and inflexible dynamics, and then all the dramatic people, if you don't penetrate enough, you can't. Um, and then we have some examples, yay! And these are really subject, these are my ear, mostly. I picked some of these from the chart that you gave us, compiled mm -hmm. by you and Barbara Shirley, Shirley Emmons, mm -hmm. yeah, Shirley Emmons and that did that. I took some, I took some of those, but some of them I chose myself because I thought they embodied that mm -hmm, thought mm -hmm, more. Mm -hmm. The timbre is timber, uh, tender, it's a lightweight. Um, she's a good actress and she is fantastic with her German. Um, next we have our Latin lyric number two, Holy Hill, who okay. also. <laughs> And that sills towards the end of her right? career. Right, it's disgusting. That's like 19, she's like in her 40s in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Bonney, um, most of the time is categorized as a soubrette, but I thought that she, in this Tamina recording, had a lot of the light lyric characteristics. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, she does perform this stylistically correct. I'd say 
this is a little a little heavier than soubrette, only because we also sing Sophie in uh, Rosen Cavalier, and that oftentimes is a light lyric to lyric to standing. Well, I know we're not going to have time to maybe look at all of them. So. Okay. Um, what do you want to hear? At least touch on like pick a five. Um, Double Dynamite. Oh. Do you want to hear just the lyric here? A little Franny. A little bit of Franny would be good. Everybody loves Franny. Everybody, Everybody loves Franny. Franny. Oh, yes. Turned eighty. Oh. Wow. It's sweet. Can you guys just imagine sitting and singing along with that? Yep, she does. Slip syncing. Yeah, she is slip syncing. Because I've watched her sing that, and it don't Not look that easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, gotta have well, Birgit Nilsson. Yeah, Come right. on. Oh, oh, and you can hear a difference. Oh, it's gonna be so good. I've been told by more than one person that, you know, when they paired Corelli with, up with her on Turandot, because he was the only one who stood a chance, you know. He had, the, had bigger lips. Well, uh, he's, he's, he's a surprised. tall man anyway, but, you know, he would sing and you'd go, I've never heard, a, I mean, the people said you never heard a tenor who had that kind of a penetrating sound. Mm -hmm. And then she would sing and you wouldn't hear the orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's huge voice, huge penetrating voice. Okay. I think the best utilization for the European pop system is um, as a career guide, especially if you want to sing in Europa. And in her book, The Opposite of Career Guide, she defends the European pop system. Uh, she describes it as a system used by European opera concerts to hire singers and cast their operas, and by opera singers to ensure the ensemble of their careers. Um, it's also a way to prepare yourself for the audition process. The pop system is used to hire, fire, organize, ensure all roles are covered, and is surprisingly balanced for budget. Um, and it's not really about limitations, but rather more of a way to market yourself um, among a million different genres. Um, here's the cover of the book. I love this book. It's the best. Um, pop, or fete, plural, um, means branch, speciality, or department. It's like uh, you're a specialist, like a gastroenterologist, or a marinologist, or a podiatrist. 
Um, and express the content given the box that best fits one's current vocal characteristics and then move to the other box categories with age and experience. Um, and Bradley focuses a lot on vocal characteristics, mechanics and physical traits, and vocal demands for classification. So that kind of plays you down at the bottom. Box equals voice plus range plus size plus tenor plus physical build plus age and experience plus desire plus frequency of performance. Um, it's, these are all important factors. Uh, but mostly these all combine to things that you could uh, sing over and over and over again without getting tired. Um, the Germans classify their box between serious box and character box. Your serious box are your leading roles and protagonists, large powerful voices, imposing physical builds and personalities. Um, they're ones that uh, require voice and personality as well as significant experience and artistic writing. So usually the, um, the older singers, the, the ones who are more experienced, um, and they include titles such as lyric soprano, young dramatic soprano, dramatic coloratura soprano, dramatic soprano, high dramatic soprano. And then you have your character roles, which are acting slash secondary roles um, or uh, compromario Mario roles. They're usually comedic or buffo. Your acting ability is paramount. Um, this is really where you should be starting as a young singer. Um, and it's way easier to find a job in this category because everybody knows there are way more supporting characters than there are leads. Um, character box include lyric coloratura sopranos, soubrettes, and character sopranos. Uh, as far as career planning goes, um, she recommends that singers listen to audition and lyrics learn as many roles within their box as possible. Learn the complete roles, not just the arias, um, and it should be music that can be sung comfortably every day. You should learn most roles in this box and also delve into a few in a heavier box and a lighter box. And this can increase your uh, marketability within the house. Um, and always keep your age and experience in mind. Uh, the Kluber soprano box um, and role examples are as follows. He has his Engsengering Sopran, which means a beginning soprano. And they'll sing like those little teeny tiny couple liner roles within operas, um, the Spiel Sopran or the Soubrette Soprano. For example, Gianetta in Le Vie Libre d'Amore, Perfetta, Papagena, Barbarina, the Lyrica Coloratura Sopran, which is uh, like Adina and Norina and Marie and Jean, and uh, the Dramatica Coloratura Sopran, which is Anna Boleyn, Cleopatra, Pierluigi, Violetta, um, Lyrica Sopran, Marceline, from Pigrillo, Micaela, Susanna, and you. Susanna? Yeah, Susanna. Go figure. According to Kluber, <laughs> the okay. beautiful soprano. Um, and then young dramatic soprano, a young dramatic soprano, which is like Io Solta, the Countess, Dini, Sotisan, and Tempo Sopran, which is like Carmen, Melisande, and Mrs. Sedley, Dramatic Sopran, Leonore. Alcetti, Turingo, Frida, the Duchess, and our Fort Dramatica Soprano, which is Electra, Isolde, and Brigida, etc. It's all on the soprano. And so I wanted to leave, end with this, is some words from Lily Lehmann. She says, long continued exertion should not be exacted of the voice at first. Even if the effects of it are not immediately felt, the damage is done in some way. In this manner, people themselves are chiefly at fault because they cannot get enough as long as they take pleasure in it. No woman of less than 24 years could sing soubrette parts, none of less than 28 years second parts, and none of less than 35 years dramatic parts. That is nearly enough. So I wanted to know um, your thoughts on this quote. She sang into her 70s. Now she's talking about on stage in opera houses. Mm -hmm. So that's a little that's different than yeah. doing the aria in a studio or something. What about like undergrad programs? If you're performing roles, then right. you can't follow that.
I mean, she's, be, she's being cautious. She's <laughs> being cautious. number of professional singers. I mean, Domingo was singing at Mexican National Opera doing supporting tenor roles at 20. Mm -hmm. You know, he was singing, and, and he made his Met debut at 28. 27, excuse me, 27. Um, in a big old heavy lyric part. He's not your typical guy. Mm -hmm. Now, Pavarotti was in his 30s. He was 33, and he debuted in Rodolfo, which is a lighter part than the part that Domingo, they debuted within about 10 days of each other in 1968. Um, but Pavarotti sang Rodolfo when he was 25. I've got a recording of it. You know, these are, these are legendary singers. The, the vast majority of us, you know, were finishing grad school at 25 to 27 or eight, you know, depending on how many years you've taken. And you're going out and doing young artist programs and you're covering roles and you get a youth performance or something and you're doing scenes and then you're going into maybe a resident artist thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's late 20s to, 30 or so before you're really setting foot in leading roles on stages. So she sings Zalame and Aida and Tosca and things like that in smaller houses. Mm -hmm. she, you know, she could not sing Tosca at the Met, you know, in a 3,800 seat house. Um, she sang uh, Balami Mascara uh, in Austin, and I think she did Tosca. Yeah, she did Tosca up in Austin. Um, and she does, um, you know, Gitarrschkat and some things, and Lulu. Um, yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. You know, but, but again, that's Aida in, you know, an 800 seat house mm -hmm. in Germany, not Aida in Covent Garden or the Met in a 3,000 plus seat house. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different animal. Smaller orchestra, smaller stage, smaller house. Um, she sung at New York City Opera, and she did a New York City Opera, I don't think she did a tour, but she, you know, she sung with regional companies here in the U.S., Dallas and Austin, New York City, uh, and uh, New Orleans, and, and things like that, and then in houses in, in Germany and Switzerland and things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, singing those roles, if she were to try to go into bigger houses, she would be singing lighter parts. Mm -hmm. Because she would be singing lighter lyric parts than singing the, you know, Jugendliche mm -hmm. and, and even Dramatische kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And her German is absolutely fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's doing Zalame. I think she's in rehearsal to Zalame right now. Mm -hmm. And she sung at the Bolshoi. Uh, she, dang, she sang Lulu at the Bolshoi, which that's a big house, but you know, that's a, that's a different kind of piece mm -hmm. and a different kind of orchestra than a Wagner orchestra. So. Yeah. I would definitely encourage you guys um, to buy that Pearl Wooden Guinness book mm -hmm. if you are considering a career overseas. Um, it's got a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Not just about the box system, but about
Yeah. Yay. All right, can you send, just send me this? Yeah. And um, maybe, are you comfortable with the ordinary on the route as well, so they can all have it? All righty, groovy.